Welcome back to Soundbites Ultrasound. My name is Dr. Phil Pereira, and in this video, we're going to look further onto the rapid ultrasound and shock examination, or the rush evaluation, specifically examining part one, evaluation of the pump or evaluation of cardiac status in the hypotensive patient. In the last video, I showed this table, which encompasses a lot of information. However, let's focus on line one, and we can see here how evaluation of the pump can further assess which type of shock our patient has by seeing characteristic findings of the heart within the four categories of shock. So hopefully we'll begin to make more sense of this table by moving through this first video. Step one, evaluation of the pump encompasses three main elements. The first of which is to examine the heart for the presence of a pericardial effusion, and if a pericardial effusion is seen, to further evaluate the heart for potential cardiac tamponade requiring a pericardiocentesis. Step number two would be to evaluate the left ventricle for contractility as an assessment of how much fluid this heart can handle. Part three would be assessment of the heart for right ventricular strain, which in the right clinical context may signify a massive pulmonary embolus as the etiology for hypotension. For the evaluation of the pump or cardiac evaluation, we're going to utilize the three main cardiac windows. Here we see the first major one, probe position A, which is the parasternal window onto the heart. In this window, there's two main views, the parasternal long and short axis views of the heart. We can also move the probe further inferiorly to the subxiphoid position as shown in probe position B, where we can see the heart from a more inferior aspect. We can then move the probe more laterally to probe position C, the apical window onto the heart, where there's several views that can be used here, to evaluate the heart from a more lateral orientation. Let's review how to perform the cardiac evaluation by beginning with the parasternal long axis view of the heart. Here we want to use a smaller footprint phased array probe that can easily fit in between the ribs to get a good view onto the heart. We'll generally begin in intercostal space three or four with a marker dot on the probe down towards the patient's left elbow. Now that's with the caveat that the ultrasound screen indicator is maintained toward the left of the screen. Now moving the patient into left lateral decubitus position may aid in assessment of the heart as it moves the heart closer to the chest wall and may give you a better view if it's difficult to see the heart initially with a patient supine. Here's the anatomy of the heart that we'll see from the parasternal long axis view. Notice that the right ventricle will be the most superficial chamber and just deep and to the left of the right ventricle we'll see the left ventricle. We also see the left atrium to the right of the left ventricle and the mitral valve in between the two chambers. Now to the right of the left ventricle, we'll see the aortic valve, and to the right of the aortic valve, we'll see a small part of the left ventricular outflow tract. Here's a video of the parasternal long axis view of the heart in action. Again, we'll remember the right ventricle as the most superficial chamber, and deep to the right ventricle, the left ventricle. We see here the left atrium to the right of the left ventricle, and notice the mitral valve flipping up and down in between the left atrium and the left ventricle. We also see the aortic valve there to the right of the left ventricle. And another very important structure to look for on the parasternal long axis of the heart is the descending aorta, which will be a cylinder in cross section just posterior to the left atrium. Now that will define the posterior pericardial reflection, which we can see here with a small indicator arrow. And this is very important when we try to determine if fluid around the heart is pericardial or plural, as we'll go through in some upcoming videos. This illustration reinforces the difference between pericardial and plural effusion from the parasternal long axis view. In the image to the left, I'm first showing the descending aorta, that cylinder seen in cross section just posterior to the mitral valve. Notice the posterior pericardial reflection, that white line that comes off just anterior to the descending aorta. In this case, we see fluid, but notice that it layers out anterior to the descending aorta and posterior pericardial reflection, and therefore is within the pericardial sac. That's to be differentiated from the image to the right, where we again identify the descending aorta and the posterior pericardial reflection. Notice here that the fluid is posterior to both, and therefore within the pleural cavity. So some very important landmarks to identify when trying to figure out if fluid is pericardial versus pleural. Next, we'll take a look at a video and here, again, we'll begin by identifying the posterior pericardial reflection and the descending aorta. Notice the descending aorta seen just posterior to the left atrium, 
and the white line that is the pericardium, or the posterior pericardial reflection. And I'll identify that with a small indicator arrow, first tracing the descending aorta, and next the posterior pericardial reflection. Now we see anechoic or dark fluid around the heart here, but notice that it's anterior to both the descending aorta and the posterior pericardial reflection, and therefore is within the pericardial sac. And in fact here we can see some fluid anterior to the heart as well as posterior. Now let's take a look at another video, first identifying the descending aorta and posterior pericardial reflection. We'll look at those with a small indicator arrow, again identifying the descending aorta and the posterior pericardial reflection. Here we see a large amount of anechoic or dark fluid, but notice here that it's posterior to both the descending aorta and the posterior pericardial reflection. In this case, this is a pleural effusion and not pericardial. Notice we can also see lung moving back and forth as the patient breathes within the pleural effusion. Now that we've learned how to determine if fluid is pericardial versus pleural, let's look at this video clip. We'll first identify that descending aorta and posterior pericardial reflection, and we see that this fluid is anterior to both and therefore pericardial. So the next step would be to look at the right side of the heart, in this case the right ventricle, for diastolic deflection that could indicate early tamponade physiology. And we can see here that there's fluid both anterior and posterior to the heart, and we notice the serpentine deflection of the right ventricle that is worrisome for early tamponade physiology. And in fact, this patient's blood pressure was noted to be decreasing on serial evaluations. The next step in pump evaluation, or cardiac evaluation, is to determine contractility of the left ventricle. Here we see the three main chambers, as seen from the parasternal long axis view of the heart, the right ventricle, left atrium, and as shown by the small indicator arrow, the left ventricle. Notice that during systole, the endocardial walls of this left ventricle almost closed down completely, indicating excellent contractility. We can also see that the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve flips open and almost slaps up against the septum with each heartbeat, indicating again good contractility of the left ventricle. So if this patient was hypotensive, we could actually give this patient quite a lot of fluid before putting the patient into pulmonary edema. We can further investigate contractility by calculating fractional shortening of the left ventricle. This is commonly done by using M-mode ultrasound and placing the cursor across the left ventricle from the parasternal long axis view. Here we see the tracings of the right ventricle, the septum as shown with a small indicator arrow, and now the posterior wall. Here we see the chamber size at maximum of the left ventricle during diastole and there systole. And we can calculate end diastolic diameter, which is shown here by caliper A, and measured at 2.96 centimeters of the left ventricle. We can also measure end systolic diameter of the left ventricle, as shown by caliper B, at 1.0 centimeters. So to calculate fractional shortening, what we take is the difference between end diastolic diameter and end systolic diameter over end diastolic diameter. And that gives us here a fractional shortening of 62%. Anything above 35 to 40% is considered normal. And in this case, we would gauge excellent contractility as judged by a calculation of fractional shortening. Now let's take a look at another patient who came into the emergency department with a low blood pressure of 80 over palp. Here we see the three main chambers from the parasternal long axis view and notice the very poor contractility of the left ventricle. We can see that the endocardial walls move little from diastole through to systole. And we can further see that there's little motion of the mitral valve. And this indicates poor blood flow between the left atrium and left ventri ventricle corroborating a low contractility status. So in this patient, we're going to have to be careful about the amount of fluid loading as this patient may easily go into pulmonary edema. We can calculate the fractional shortening of this hypocontractile heart by placing the M-mode cursor across the left ventricle and we see A end systolic diameter of 3.78. We can also look at the widest diameter as B end diastolic diameter which is calculated at 5.17 centimeters. Therefore, this fractional shortening is much decreased at 27%. Let's move on to discuss the parasternal short axis view of the heart. A pearl here is not to take the probe off of the chest once you've obtained the parasternal long axis view of the heart. 
Simply rotate the probe 90 degrees clockwise, so now the indicator dot on the probe is down towards the patient's right hip. Now that's with a caveat that the ultrasound screen indicator dot is positioned to the left of the screen. Again, moving the patient into left lateral decubitus position may help imaging from this parasternal short axis view. From the parasternal short axis view of the heart, we'll be imaging the heart in cross section. Therefore, we'll see the left ventricle in cross section as a cylinder to the bottom right of the image and the right ventricle to the upper left. Let's now look at a video of the parasternal short axis view of the heart, and we can again see that the left ventricle would be the prominent chamber cut in cross section. Here we can actually see the mitral valve moving up and down through each heartbeat. Notice again the good contractility of this left ventricle. All the walls come in well from diastole through systole. So if this was a patient in shock, we can go ahead and give plenty of fluids before starting the patient on pressors. Next, let's take a look at another heart. Here we see a patient who came into the emergency department with a blood pressure of 70 over palp and a fast heart rate. And we can notice that the left ventricle is very hyperdynamic, meaning that it's almost completely squeezing down during systole and also tachycardic. This is usually seen in a septic or hypovolemic condition, indicating that this is a heart that's begging for fluids. So the right action would be to fluid load in this patient. In this video clip, we see another finding. We see behind the left ventricle an anechoic or dark fluid collection surrounding the heart. And I'll show that with a small indicator arrow. This is a pericardial effusion circumferentially surrounding the heart here. And notice that it layers out behind the left ventricle and right ventricle. Let's now take another look at a parasternal short axis view of the heart in a hypotensive patient. Here we see very poor contractility of the left ventricle as shown here with the small indicator walls by very little endocardial movement from diastole through to systole. And also notice the very poor movement or little movements of the mitral valve during the cardiac cycle. So this is a pump in jeopardy and one in which we'd want to be careful about the amount of fluids that we give during a resuscitation. We can also put M-mode ultrasound directly across the left ventricle and short axis, again looking at the change from end diastole through end systole just getting a fractional shortening, and again confirming very poor contractility or poor function of the cardiac pump. The next cardiac imaging window that we'll discuss is a subxiphoid. Here the probe is placed under the xiphoid tip of the sternum, aiming the probe down and up towards the left shoulder. Now we want to keep the marker dot on the probe towards the right side of the patient, with the caveat that the ultrasound screen indicator is positioned to the left of the screen. From this view, we're looking from an inferior position up towards the heart, and we're going to see the liver as our acoustic window onto the heart, and the right side of the heart closer to the probe. We'll see the right ventricle and right atrium close to the probe and further away the left ventricle and left atrium. We can also see the tricuspid and mitral valves from this view. Here's a video clip of a heart taken from the subxiphoid window. We recall that the liver is our acoustic window from this view, and we see the right side chambers, superficial and to the top of the screen. We see the right ventricle and the right atrium with a tricuspid valve flipping up and down in between the two chambers. We see the left ventricle, and with a small indicator arrow there, I'm showing the poor contractility of this left ventricle. Notice the poor percentage change through from diastole through to systole. We see the left atrium to the left of the left ventricle and the mitral valve. Now with a small indicator arrow, I'm now tracing the posterior pericardial reflection around the heart, and there's the anterior pericardial reflection. Now we can call these also near field and far field pericardial reflections as well. But notice here that there's no fluid within the pericardial sac. So in this case, we would not have to perform a pericardiocentesis, but we notice that the contractility of this left ventricle is compromised. Here's another subxiphoid view of the heart taken from a hypotensive patient, and right away we notice a positive finding. We see the right ventricle anterior and the left ventricle posterior, and we see here an anechoic or dark fluid collection layering out around the heart circumferentially. And with a small indicator arrow, I'm showing the near field pericardium and fluid directly underneath that surrounding the heart and also around the posterior aspect of the heart just above the posterior pericardial reflection.
So in this case, we have a pretty large circumferential pericardial effusion present. Once we document a pericardial effusion, we want to look for the motion of the right side of the heart to look for diastolic deflection. Here's normal motion of the heart, even in the presence of a pericardial effusion. And to the left, we see systole with all of the chambers small, and diastole to the right, and we can see full expansion of both the right atrium and the right ventricle. So even though this patient has a pericardial effusion, we're failing to see secondary signs of cardiac tamponade as evidenced by either compression of the right atrium or the right ventricle during diastole. This illustration demonstrates diastolic compression of the right ventricle that occurs during cardiac tamponade physiology. In the image to the left, we see normal systole with all of the chambers small, and to the right, we see diastolic compression of the right ventricle, meaning that the right ventricle never fully expands during diastole. Now, cardiac tamponade physiology will first affect the right side of the heart because of the relatively lower pressure system as reference to the left side of the heart. In this video clip taken from a patient who had declining blood pressures on serial evaluations in the emergency department, we first identify a pericardial effusion from the subxiphoid view. Looking closer at the right ventricle, we see a deflection of the RV during diastole. Now, while not completely compressed in, this early diastolic deflection is concerning for early tamponade physiology, and indeed, this patient went on to full tamponade physiology with time requiring a pericardiocentesis. So again, it's going to be a spectrum of findings of the RV from early diastolic deflection onto full compression. Here we can see the findings of the right atrium as it attempts to compensate during early tamponade physiology. Notice in this right atrium, we can see a furious right atrium that's contracting at a very, very high rate to push the blood into the right ventricle and out the pulmonary system due to the higher pressures within the right side of the heart. And I've noticed this as a finding that I see quite frequently in early tamponade physiology, and I'd like to categorize this as a furious right atrium. Here's a case of a patient who presented with breast cancer and increasing shortness of breath and came to the emergency department tachycardic, diaphoretic, and hypotensive. From the subxiphoid window, right away we determine that a large circumferential pericardial effusion is present, and on closer inspection of the right ventricle, we can see that it's completely compressed in by the high pressure within the pericardial sac, indicating full-on tamponade physiology. So as we talked about, there is a spectrum from early diastolic deflection onto this finding where the RV is completely compressed in. This patient needed an emergent pericardiocentesis in the emergency department. The last window of the heart that I want to discuss is one of the most important. That is the apical window of the heart. Here the probe is placed under the left nipple at the point of maximal impulse of the heart. It really helps to have the patient in the left lateral decubitus position to bring the heart closer to the chest wall to get better imaging from this position. The probe indicator dot will be maintained towards the patient's right side with a caveat that the ultrasound screen indicator dot will be positioned to the left. This is the cardiac anatomy as seen from the apical window. Note that the probe is much closer to the ventricles, therefore the left ventricle will be to the right of the screen and superficial, the right ventricle to the left and superficial, and the atrium further away. From this view, we can also see the mitral and tricuspid valves. One of the benefits of the apical view of the heart is that we see all four chambers of the heart in relation to one another. Here's a video clip showing the apical cardiac window. Notice we have the left ventricle to the upper right, the right ventricle to the left, and the atrium further away. Here we see the small indicator arrow showing the endocardial walls of the left ventricle, and notice that they have a high percentage change from diastole through to systole. This indicates good contractility, and if this patient was in shock, this heart could take quite a lot of fluid before going into pulmonary edema. So good contractility from the apical cardiac window. Let's contrast that last video clip with this one, and here we see an apical four-chamber view. Again, we see the left ventricle to the right, the right ventricle to the left. Here we notice the very poor percentage change from diastole through to systole of the left ventricle. So very poor contractility of this left ventricle, and in this shock patient, 
we'd have to be careful about the amount of fluids that is given prior to pressors as we don't want to throw the patient into pulmonary edema. Here's an illustration showing what will happen with a pericardial effusion and cardiac tamponade from the apical view of the heart, looking specifically at the right atrium. To the left, we see systole, and we see all chambers compressed in during the cycle of systole. To the right, we see diastole, and notice the normal change of the chambers from systole to diastole as they normally expand. We see the right atrium completely expanded. Now in this view, that is significant for cardiac tamponade, we note the right atrium is deflected in during diastole, showing high relative pressures within the pericardial sac, pressing in on the right atrium during diastole. So diastolic collapse of the right atrium is one of the findings to look for in cardiac tamponade. Frankly, I look for right ventricular collapse first, and that's a more sensitive finding, but right atrial collapse during diastole is another finding that's commonly quoted. Here we see a very large cardiac effusion or pericardial effusion as noted from the apical view, and I'm tracing that with the small indicator arrow, and we see the large anechoic fluid stripe around the right atrium. Notice this right atrium is again taking on the appearance of a furious atrium as it compresses almost completely in during a systole to push the blood into the right ventricle. But I call your attention to the desynchronous movements from the right ventricle and the right atrium. What we notice here is that there's a little bit of asynchrony between the two chambers, indicating early tamponade physiology. And this was manifested by a patient who had relatively decreasing blood pressures in the emergency department. In conclusion, the rapid ultrasound and shock or rush protocol was formulated as a non-invasive means using ultrasound to assess the physiology of the patient in shock. In this video, we've covered step one, evaluation of the pump or cardiac evaluation, looking at three main categories. Step one was examination for pericardial effusion and potential cardiac tamponade. And we spoke about the fact that we're going to be looking for diastolic deflection of the right atrium, or more specifically, the right ventricle, as signs of cardiac tamponade. Step two, evaluation of left ventricular contractility, was seen as a visual calculation of the change of the endocardial walls from diastole through to systole. We also spoke about how we can calculate using M-mode ultrasound a fractional shortening, and we reinforced that a normal shortening should be above 35 to 40%. Step number three, evaluation of the right ventricle for dilatation, we're going to defer to part three, evaluation of the pipes, as it best fits in with evaluation of pulmonary embolus and DVT. Returning to the table outlining the findings in the RUSH protocol, we'll look specifically at step one, evaluation of the pump. In hypovolemic shock, the findings that we'll be looking for are hypercontractile heart with small chamber size. In cardiogenic shock, we'll be looking for a hypocontractile heart that may be dilated in size, especially if there is systolic dysfunction. With obstructive shock, we'll be looking for generally a hypercontractile heart and we may see a pericardial effusion with signs of cardiac tamponade, as we talked about in this video. We'll go further in video number four to talk about the findings of RV strain and cardiac thrombus that may be seen with pulmonary embolus. In distributive shock, usually sepsis, we'll see a hypercontractile heart early, and as sepsis continues, we may see a failing heart with decreased contractility. So I'm glad I could cover part one of the RUSH exam evaluation of the pump in this video module. I hope to see you back as SoundBytes continues as we move forward to look specifically at part two, evaluation of the tank, and part three, evaluation of the pipes in the RUSH protocol.